there is one anime feature in particular that shattered all my preconceptions of what a story could be. And that there was this entire world of Japanese anime and manga stories that I had never been exposed to. And that feature length animation was Akira. Akira was this dark, disturbing, dystopian, violent, Japanese, cyberpunk, chaotic animation that was so weird to me that it caught me completely off guard. I saw Akira when I was like 12 years old. And do you know what else you're learning how to do as a boy when you're 12? Masturbate. Yeah, so between masturbation sessions and Akira, it was kind of like sensory overload. And you know, now that I think about it, Akira has a lot of parallels to puberty. You know, you got these quote unquote powers that you don't really know what to do with and that you can't control and they're just wreaking havoc on your body. How's that for a fan theory? Released on July 16th, 1988, Akira the animated feature was based on Katsuhiro Otomo's epic manga of the same name. And the manga began its run back in 1982, six years prior to the anime's release. Now, I say that the anime is based on the manga because I recently just finished reading it, and the manga's over 2,000 pages long. And while the animation does resemble the comic, it's really only a cross-section of the story, mainly books one and six of this six-volume series. So here's the story. Akira takes place in this gritty Neo-Tokyo, some 30 plus years after this Hiroshima-esque nuclear-grade explosion levels the original city. That's 30 plus years after World War III. Now in the manga, that's in the year 2030, but the anime takes place, wait for it, right now in 2019. And luckily, at the time of this recording, World War III hasn't taken place yet, but give it time. The story follows this rugged biker gang leader named Kaneda, his ace Tetsuo, and their band of delinquent friends through the streets of Neo Tokyo. Even though these are some really tough kids, you don't really get the sense that they're inherently bad. But because they came up in this harsh post-war environment, they're really a group of badasses. They really care about each other, and they're willing to beat the shit out of anybody that's a threat to them or the people they care about. A fight with another local gang sets Tetsuo on this literal collision course with this telekinetic child that changes his life forever. So after running into this strange boy, it awakens these equally strange powers in him. And once those powers reach their full potential, all hell breaks loose. I don't know whether to credit this to Steve Jobs or Pablo Picasso, but some great man said something along the lines of, good artists borrow, great artists steal. And I think Katsuhiro Otomo did exactly that. I was watching this interview that Otomo did about the making of Akira. And it was really fascinating to see just where he drew his inspiration from. So let's connect some dots. Have you ever heard of the robot Gigantor? While some of you hardcore manga and anime fans may know Gigantor as Tetsujin 28, which literally translates to mean Iron Man 28. Tetsujin 28 Go is this 1956 old school manga classic that had a follow-up animation in 1963 created by Mitsuteru Yokoyama. And it's really cool to see how it connects. So Gigantor is this government weapon, and in a way, Akira is too, even though he can't be controlled very well. I also found it kind of cool that Akira in the comics is test subject number 28, as a nod to the Gigantor robot. 
even Akira's protagonist is based on Tetsujin 28 Go. Tetsujin 28 is controlled by this spunky, gun-wielding 10-year-old named Shotaro Kaneda. And who's the protagonist in Akira? This spunky, gun-wielding teenager named Shotaro Kaneda. So when I watch Akira now, it feels like it's this boy's teenage adventures being told in a future time. While Otomo wanted to create something in the same vein as Tetsujin 28 Go, Akira kind of morphed into something else entirely. So Otomo ended up creating something that was really, really fresh and truly unique. Akira's animation style made it special. It's the reason why it still holds up even more than 30 years later. And in this post-Pixar era, we live in this world where computers can easily bear much of the larger brunt of that animation load. We live in a reality where technology allows you to create worlds that you couldn't even fathom before. And in that world, these painstakingly hand-drawn, layered animation cells feel like a dying art form. But even now in 2019, it's really hard to deny just how masterfully done every animation sequence was in that feature, especially for its time. Using a team of over 60 animators and over 160,000 animation cells, Otomo and his team were not playing around when they made this. They took it so seriously and the details show in spades. When people mention Akira, my brain still kicks back these iconic animation sequences. Now I'm not gonna sit here and claim that Otomo is the master of cohesive storytelling because I've seen far more cohesive stories, but I will say he is a master at getting you to feel what his characters feel. And that's really not a surprise because when you read the manga, it does such a great job of capturing these characters' expressions. A great example of this is right after Tetsuo's powers awaken for the very first time. Let's pick apart one short scene. You don't need to understand a single word of Japanese in order for the storytelling to shine through. The animation and the action speak volumes. Look at Tetsuo's face. You got the squinted eyes, the furrowed brow, the sweating, the screaming, and these give you his core emotions. But on top of these core emotions, I love how Otomo uses light to emphasize this pain. And I love this small detail when Tetsuo's stumbling away and you can see with every excruciating step that his head is hurting him so badly that the pain is about to bring him to his knees. In the anime, the scenes that are storytelling gold to me are the ones where Tetsuo's powers are kind of skirting this line between reality and imagination. I love how this scene in the lab goes from almost cute and cuddly to straight up nightmare fuel in a matter of seconds. Even outside of these scenes where Tetsuo's going a bit mental, Akira is just loaded with these other wonderful scenes. Another scene that I really love is when Tetsuo gets his arm blown off by this military weapon and he gets so pissed off that he flies into outer space. And in the vacuum of space, since there is no sound, all you see during this sequence is Tetsuo's silent rage as he proceeds to telekinetically smash this satellite weapon. Akira was groundbreaking, ambitious animation that was truly ahead of its time. Compared to other animation I had seen at the time, Akira was the equivalent of Otomo telling other animation studios, hold my beer. Another really fascinating thing about Akira is that it's incomplete, or maybe we should say open-ended. And part of me thinks that Katsuhiro Otomo may have done this on purpose. Why? The film was completed in 1988, while the manga ended in 1990. So the feature was finished before the manga ever was, which is kind of backwards when you look at how anime creation is done today. Usually, the manga is created first, and then the anime is sourced from it. But I think the way Otomo did it was really smart, because it allows the animation to be this work 
that easily stands on its own. As a fan, one of the cool things about that is that there's such giant gaps between the manga story and the on-screen story. And what are some of those gaps? Well, I'm glad you asked. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you all of them because I don't want to spoil the entire thing for you, but the manga is worth reading. So one of the biggest gaps I saw is a character named Lady Miyako. And in the feature, you see her for maybe less than 30 seconds and she gets killed off just like that. But in the comics, she has a much bigger role and she's actually powered herself and she plays a big role in the fight against Tetsuo. And then there's Akira. I think a big part of what makes the animated feature confusing is that you're trying to figure out who or what Akira is. Akira's really ambiguous in the film. You see Akira's body parts in cryogenic storage and you kind of get a glimpse of him at the end of the film. But that is a really big difference between the manga and the film. In the manga, Akira is an actual boy and he is the most powerful of the telekinetic beings in this comic. And you come to find out that not only is he super powerful, but he is the reason World War III started. So the first time his power is triggered, that's what set off that giant explosion. Perhaps my favorite gap that I got to fill from reading the comics is some of the details of the government experiments that created these super powered kids. You find out that the numbers printed on their palms actually correspond to how powerful they are. So the kids in the 20s were these rare kids with uncommon abilities that resulted from those experiments. Number 28, of course, Akira, was the most powerful, but number 25, Kyoko, number 26, Takashi, and number 27, Masaru, were also powerful in their own right. And a rather grim detail that you find out is that when Akira's power is triggered, setting off that explosion in Tokyo, not only did it destroy much of Tokyo, but it also killed most of the kids, like the other test subjects in these experiments. And number 25, 26, and 27 were the only survivors. And a side note, Tetsuo is designated number 41. And I don't know if that means he's way more powerful than the other espers, but you really don't get a sense that he's more powerful than Akira in the comics. At least I didn't anyway. So maybe he's potentially the most powerful. These are just a few examples, but the manga is loaded with these kind of gaps and holes that you just would never know about if you only watched the anime. There are so many drug references in the comics that just are not even shown even close to the same extent in the anime. Tetsuo has an orgy in the comic book that we never get to see on screen. And that's unfortunate because isn't everything just a little bit better with an orgy? Um, not really. Not when it's Tetsuo, not when it's drug-induced, and not when most of the women in that orgy end up dead. Akira touches on several different themes. There are elements of man versus man, man versus technology, and man versus society. And I think the story is every bit as layered as the animations they used to make the feature. And for some, including me, it made the story feel a little bit weird, just, just to be honest. But I think there are a lot of Japanese stories that are like that. They're just fuzzier overall, if that makes any sense. For example, when I go and watch a Ghibli film, I enjoy the film because of the animation, but I don't necessarily leave feeling satisfied because of the story. And I think that's because some anime stories don't necessarily give you this clean, clear-cut, happily ever after resolution. But I think that confusion is part of what makes Akira great. Some people watch Akira and watch it again and they think, what the f did I just watch? Other people watch it just to be mesmerized by the drawings, to see this really capable team of animators breathe life into an imaginary world on screen. Other people watch it just to do some deep story analysis. Go check out Reddit and you'll see what I mean. But whether you love it, hate it, or are confused by it, Akira makes you feel some kind of way. They say that good art is polarizing, and in the world of Japanese animation, Akira is one of those works. It's unapologetically dark and gritty, and personally, I think it's a masterpiece. And for that reason, Akira 
is one of the greatest stories ever told. Thanks for watching guys. I really had a great time going back and re-watching this anime classic. If you genuinely enjoyed this, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And in the comments, let me know what you think of Akira. Do you love it? Hate it? Find it too confusing to care? And why? It's been a blast, Japanimaniacs, and I'll catch you in the next one.